Um, I guess it's really time to uh, hear from the people we came to hear from. And so let's start with Dr. Uh, Stephanie Lowe. Uh, I'll say just a, f a few words about her. All these doctors have done so much that their, bi their, their bios are so long, I can't read all the stuff they've done. But I just wanted to mention uh, a couple things about Dr. Lowe. Uh, since 2013, she's worked as an emergency room physician at both Pomona Valley Hospital and Riverside University Hospital. And uh, she has been part of uh, the medical relief team uh, with the repatriates from Wuhan, China that came here uh, to Southern California in, in January and February of 220. So she got involved in, in this pandemic very early, right at the very beginning. Uh, she was also part of the medical relief team from uh, that went to uh, work with COVID-19 patients in New York when that city was overwhelmed with COVID-19. And uh, she volunteered there as an emergency room doctor at two different hospitals, uh, I guess Elmhurst Hospital in Queens, uh, and then uh, North Central Bronx Hospital in the Bronx. So uh, she's done an incredible amount of work. She's an incredible uh, doctor, uh, and we're very happy to have her. And so without any further introduction, Dr. Lowe, please uh, uh, tell us what your experience was and, and how, what kinds of things we would encounter if we ended up in an emergency room with COVID-19. Okay, thank you so much. That was a lovely introduction. Um, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor. I am the kind of person that needs to go out into the world and see things for myself. That is why I decided to, to do all this, this volunteer work. Um, you know, you see things on the news and in the media and I, I just, for me, I, I need to see it with my own eyes. So that's kind of why I decided to get involved. Um, when the repatriates came into um, the United States from Wuhan, they I literally had maybe 12 hours to prepare. They were originally going to go to San Bernardino County and they decided last minute to come to Riverside County. So I had to prepare because we were going to be the medical team that was going to be um, attending to them if they had any medical concerns, um, plus helped with testing and all of that. So um, being on the front lines then, it's, it seems like ages ago, but it really wasn't that long ago, um, just to see the change in um, culture of the disease and what we didn't know back then versus what we know now is just, it's quite an amazing um, journey. Um, so I um, participated in the repatriates. Um, luckily, none of them came down with COVID, so that was good. Um, and then I went right into my own hospital disaster plan um, since we were expecting a lot of um, COVID just based on what we had seen in other countries. We, I remember uh, China at first and then Italy. And then when we started seeing New York, we just knew it was coming to us. So we were developing um, an emergency surge plan and figuring out how we were going to take care of all, of all these patients with, uh, you know, on ventilators and how we were gonna manage things. Um, not only that, but it, a big part of it was trying to figure out how to manage these patients and protect the staff at the same time because we, at that time, didn't know how this disease was spreading. Was this just droplet? Was it airborne? And we were all nervous about doing certain procedures for patients. I mean, our patients' lives matter to us, um, but I also have to staff. So, you know, that was a really big challenge. Um, so we prepared for that. We had certain protocols that we um, put in place for critical patients to come in with COVID. We separated our ER at first into patients coming in with respiratory symptoms on one side and patients coming in non-respiratory symptoms. And we separated them um, to keep people from infecting each other. Plus we had tents and all of that outside uh, for like minor testing. Um, when we realized we weren't getting a huge surge, we had obviously shut the state down by that point. Um, there was obviously a huge surge going on in New York. So um, there was a call for doctors to go help there. And um, I was the first to sign up. I just sounded really exciting to me. Um, I've always wanted, I've been involved in international work for a really long time and a lot of mission work. And this was something that I, like I said, wanted to see with my own eyes. So I was flown out there, got an um, emergency credential license, 
and I am emergency medicine um, trained. That's the board certification that I have. So I am only trained to work in the emergency department or, or sort of like urgent care settings. Um, and that's what I thought I might be doing, but it ended up that they actually used me in the ICU. So I was functioning as an ICU doctor or what we call an intensivist um, in New York. Um, so as you can imagine, being a doctor out of my comfort zone, I starting to study everything I possibly can in trying to manage all these patients and working as an ICU doctor, which I hadn't done in many years. I mean, you do that in residency um, when you're training, you learn a lot of different fields, but for me to be kind of thrown in there and say go um, was, it, it was a challenge, but it was, it was a great learning experience and a very steep learning curve. The ER when I got to New York in the end of April was completely dead because everybody was now admitted into the hospital and in the ICUs. So what was overwhelmed in New York was the intensive care units. A standard hospital would have, uh, let's say a, a, a big tertiary care center maybe, or a large hospital would have maybe somewhere like around 40 beds for ICU patients. Well, when I went to Queens, Elmhurst and Queens, when I got there, there were 170 patients on ventilators. So there, of course, their entire ICU was full, but every single floor in the hospital was full of patients that were on ventilators. And they just sat there for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that was the backup. And that was why there were so many probably unnecessary deaths because of the resources. Um, they didn't have enough ICU doctors. There were two from Elmhurst that were actually functioning that were from Elmhurst. Everybody else was from different states, the military, and the same with nursing staff. You had a lot of nursing staff that were trained very quickly to work in the ICU, but they were, you know, that's not normally their area of expertise. We had the OB units um, where you would normally have a baby. Those were turned into ICUs. You had certain surgical services running ICUs like orthopedics. You know, they're normally bone doctors and they're, you know, put to the test to, you know, manage these patients on ventilators. So we were all learning to, to, how, to, to how to do this. And um, it was very uh, indescribable, really, just the amount of patients there were. What I saw around me was an average, if I could just say, I saw a lot of Latino males that had diabetes and that were very overweight. And the age range was anywhere from 40 to 90. And I would say the median age was about 60. And um, some patients didn't have comorbidities and some did, and a lot did, most did have comorbidities. Now, as far as the elderly, elderly, you know, let's just say 80 and above, there were we already know what happened with a lot of those patients in the nursing homes. A lot of those patients died. So I didn't get to see a large portion of those in the ICUs because I don't think they even made it that far. The patients that did make it that far to the emergency room got intubated. When I say intubated, that means they put the tube down and they put you on the ventilator so they're breathing for you. They got intubated immediately. And in the early training from the CDC, from doctors around the country, from doctors around the world, it was the standard of care for us. You have a patient that comes in, they can't breathe, you think they have COVID-19, you know, they don't look good, you need to intubate them and put them on a ventilator. So we were doing that very early on and realized later that we probably shouldn't have been doing that. Um, what I've learned now, because these patients, after they get intubated, if they're very severe, they stay intubated for weeks at a time, at least three weeks, four weeks. I know patients were in the hospital for two months. Um, if once you're on a ventilator for three weeks, sometimes two weeks, they automatically put a trache tracheostomy in you as a surgical procedure because you're intubated so long. Well, of course, these patients with COVID, there was so much fear around it that they weren't it, they weren't tracking these patients because there was too much fear that this would aerosolize, you know, the disease into the air and that your doctors would be getting the disease. So a lot of patients sat with these tubes and on ventilators for so so long. Um, when we started to realize that the patients that were intubated weren't doing well, in fact, the mortality rate at Elmhurst Hospital in Queens after being intubated was 
of, that was the mortality rate, those that many people died. When we learned that, we realized, okay, we've got to do something. We need to do everything possible not to keep these, or not to put these patients on ventilators. Everything that we're taught, you know, this is, this is the bread and butter of emergency medicine. We are airway specialists. This is what we do on a regular basis. Um, because, you know, it's, 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 it saves lives, you know, you put a tube down somebody, you help breathe for them until their own lungs recover, and then you can hopefully extubate them, meaning take the tube out. The problem with this disease was that it almost seemed like the intubation and the ventilator support was making them worse. They, I don't know if it was the disease process itself or their own body's immune systems that were taking over and their lungs were just getting worse and worse. Not only that, but this disease was causing such an enormous multi-organ failure. Um, it would it would make your blood clot in certain ways. So then patients would get um, not enough blood flow to their kidneys. Um, we saw a lot of strokes. Um, we saw a lot of um, some heart failure, a lot of skin um, comorbidities or some abnormalities. Um, but the amount of patients that I saw on dialysis that had never been on dialysis in their life was overwhelming. I have never put so many dialysis, ca dialysis catheters in patients that had never had dialysis before. So all of that was just a big, big surprise. So um, again, these patients stayed on ventilators. When I went back a second tour to North Central Bronx, that is where all of the patients that had been on ventilators that were what we just called them rocks because they just stayed there they all got moved to North Central Bronx um, and we took care of them long-term um, until they could hopefully be extubated. And I'll be honest with you, may, most of them didn't. Most of them did die or they were still there by the time that I left. Um, when we started to realize in the beginning that we should maybe avoid putting these patients on ventilators, we started using other devices that are called, um, I don't know, maybe some of you have CPAP machines at home for sleep apnea. We use machines like that. Um, instead of doing the ventilator, we would do these machines as long as we possibly could until you know, the patient couldn't really breathe anymore. And we use this all the time in the hospital. We do it for patients that come in with congestive heart failure exacerbations, for patients with severe COPD. We put these masks on them and these patients do very well. You don't really need to intubate them. However, in this disease, it's such a long-term disease that these poor patients were on these masks for weeks and weeks at a time. So you can imagine, you can't eat when you're on this mask. The moment you take them off the mask, their stats drop rapidly, so you have to put them back on the mask. Um, in the very, very beginning, the reason we weren't using these masks is because we were so scared that these masks were aerosolizing the COVID disease that it was going to infect everybody in the room. So we were um, very hesitant to use those what we call non-invasive machines, and that's why we were intubating everybody. When we realized that patients weren't doing well on the ventilators, that's when we started moving more to the, the, the machines, the BiPAP machines, the CPAP machines. Um, having to put in nasogastric tubes so the patient could still feed because uh, obviously you need nutrition and things like that for your body to recover through a bad disease um, what i found most helpful through all of this that you know we didn't know in the beginning was there is what we call high flow nasal cannula it is basically a special machine that it goes on your nose and it pumps oxygen in at very very high rates and uh, in very high percentage um, into where you still have the use of your mouth, but it also gives you the support that you need in your lungs. It helps keep your lungs open. It helps open them as well. And the patient's a lot more comfortable. I saw that most patients that were severe COVID did better on these nasal cannula machines. So when I was doing consults around the hospital, you know, seeing that, that people needed to progress to more critical care, I would always ask for high flow nasal cannula because that was what people were most comfortable with. Um, unfortunately, there were four in the entire hospital in Elmhurst, four high flow nasal cannula machines. Um, we had tons of BiPAP and CPAP machines, but again, like I said, patients are wearing a mask for two weeks at a time. You can imagine skin breakdown, depression, all of that um, became a factor. So, you know, in the media and, you know, in the CDC, and when you uh, were looking at the news, everything was about, we're not going to have enough ventilators. We're not going to have enough ventilators. We had plenty of ventilators, thank God. 
But if thinking about it now, I would say we need these non-invasive machines. This is where the money needed to go because that is what these patients needed. Um, so those were the patients that I saw did uh, the best. Um, again, not every patient gets such a severe presentation. Um, uh, most of the patients that I have seen, you know, at my own hospital coming back into, you know, Riverside County, um, obviously very, we had high numbers in July. Uh, most patients did recover. Um, and what we learned was that most patients coming into the emergency room that were struggling to breathe, that did require oxygen, we refused to intubate them. We, at all costs, we said to each other, we are not going to intubate this patient unless absolutely necessary, last resort. So what we would see were these patients coming in that their oxygen saturation, you know, they're supposed to be 100%, a nine, over 92 would be fine, but they were satting at like 60%, 50%. Normally, a type of um, patient you would see like that would be someone that needs an airway, someone that needs the tube, and someone that needs a ventilator. Well, we were realizing if they're sitting there somewhat comfortable, not gasping for air, and their mind was still there, they weren't confused, I let them sit at that 50% saturation and did everything I could to get it up as high as I possibly could. Whether it was just oxygen itself, whether it was the mask that we had discussed or the hypo-nasal cannula, that was always my first choice to go to. Um, and then I noticed that patients did better, the less that we had to intubate them. Now, patients that obviously, you know, you, you're so altered, your, your oxygen levels and CO2 levels are so out of whack that you're not even functioning in the mind anymore. Those are patients that sometimes you do have to intubate and that's what you're, that's what you, that's last resort and you do so. But what we know now is that these patients can stay on these oxygen machines, even in a low sat for a while before you're having to um, put them on a ventilator. And that is what I think is the big, biggest learning for us doctors in, preventing deaths from the disease. There's tons of research going on. Um, there's a research paper that comes out every single week of uh, managing these patients. Uh, we've learned so much. Um, we've tried different therapies. We've tried conv convalescent plasma. You know, Now I think the uh, standard of care is remdesivir and dexamethasone, which is a steroid. But still the evidence isn't superb. It's not, oh my God, this is the life-saving treatment. It's still a process through the, for the body. So um, it's, it's still a challenge and we're definitely um, not out of the woods yet, um, but at least we know we're not afraid to get the disease anymore as doctors. I'm not worried about the disease aerosolizing. I protect myself. I never got COVID that I know of. Um, so I'm eager to jump in, perform any necessary procedures that are necessary uh, for that patient. Um, I have adequate PPE. Um, I am going to let a patient do as best they can with their own breathing before I take over. And that is what I would recommend to you. If you were to come down with COVID, most likely you're going to have mild symptoms. If you were going to have some shortness of breath, you have to call on oxygen and patients do okay. If it becomes so severe, I would really, and it depends on where you're at, uh, what type, part of the country you're at, or if you're in a rural area or a hospital that's you know, just a small tiny community hospital versus a very tertiary care academic center, I would ha hold off on intubation as long as possible until you basically, I would say until you couldn't really make your own decisions. I would definitely hold off as much as possible and ask for non-invasive therapies prior to ventilator. Um, and that's what I, that's, that's the research. That's my observational research. So um, I'm here to answer any questions. I'm sure there's many questions. And um, I mean, there's so much more to talk about in general, but I, you know, I want to be able to answer all your questions individually if you have them. And um, just let, I just want to let you know that this, we are getting through this. Um, our numbers are going down. Um, we are learning so much more about this disease and seeing a lot lower mortality than we did in the beginning. And I just want to say that New York was real. It was what it was. And I think the reason it was what it was, so high mortality because of the lack of resources, uh, not necessarily disease itself and what we knew then. So Sharon's account uh, in 
online somewhere about Elmhurst. I just wanted to add, raise two questions because I remember that as first of all being that the COVID patients were not isolated from the regular patients at the hospital. Is that is that right? And sure, anymore, right? You're mute. Okay. Yes, and I do remember and being like, okay, hold on a second. I was there. This is not the case. So not your okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you. yes, that was the hospital. So, oh my goodness. Absolutely isolated. Now, in any ICU in the country, most likely you're going to have one patient per room. That's just the way that it, most ICUs are made, I, I just depending on the hospital. But what happened was we were putting patients to COVID. That is 100% true. Then the, the thing that really got through people for a loop was that patients were being put in rooms apparently that had tested negative for COVID. I personally, but I can tell you 100% that testing was not perfect. There were several, several patients that never tested positive but we know they had it. When, like they had everything else. They, it's just weird. Like they didn't mount the response, but they had the COVID lungs. You would, in the CT scan, it was classic COVID lungs. They had all of the organs with the COVID and there was no other explanation for why they had that. So I think that's where the confusion came was because we would say we have, um, when I went to the Bronx, for example, we had our, COVID and non-COVID because um, they were all moved there from other hospitals and we would say oh this is the COVID side and this is the non-COVID side we would call it the non-COVID side but to us it was the co it was the exact same thing it was just that they never tested treated them exactly the same we did separate them but they all had the same disease so I think probably what happened at Elmhurst was they were running out of room and they just knew they had to start putting people together and they put people together disease regardless of test or not it's not like they put a patient in diabetic ketoacidosis which is you know not a respiratory disease at all it's not like they put them in the same room with COVID at all whatsoever I mean there were strict guidelines in effect to try as much as possible to separate patients that didn't have COVID with COVID and I can tell you out every single floor of Elmhurst and it's like a nine floor hospital there was one year non-COVID, one unit. Everything else was COVID. So you can imagine the entire hospital's worth was totally full of COVID. And patients that had come in, it took like three to five days to get a positive test back. So if there's COVID, we still put them on the COVID floors because it was too risky to put them on a floor with non-COVID patients that you knew were non-COVID patients. So that that's where the confusion came, is that the testing wasn't 100% and some patients never tested positive, but I'm certain that is what they died of. There was another allegation in that article that they were all being ventilated because they got more money, the hospital got more money for treating them. That is so frightening to anybody being hospitalized. Right, exactly. No, that never, ever, ever happened. I, I, nothing was ever told to me to make COVID a diagnosis. Never, ever, nothing. And, and you know, I work for a private group um, at my own hospital, and I mean, I do know that there are certain things in billing that you always have to keep in mind because you need to pay the bill, pay the hospital bills, and so you don't want to make want to make sure critical care time is documented, are documented, so that the hospital gets the the money. You know, we don't want to be in the negative. And as far as COVID goes, the only thing we were told was if a patient's coming in for testing or you suspected that they might have COVID, just try to put that in your diagnosis. So follow the records. It wasn't, had nothing to do with money at all. There is no way, and I'm telling you, nobody wanted to intubate these patients or put them on a ventilator because it put us at risk. And it was just dangerous. It was, there are secretions everywhere. Um, you, ha you can only have a certain number of people in the room. We just did not want to intubate these patients because we were scared of ourselves. So the fact that we were just doing it for money is, is just crazy, is a crazy idea put out there I it still baffles me how things you know these rumors start but that is absolutely not the case every single doctor and nurse respiratory therapist that I work with 
their number one priority was the patients honestly say that it was it was an amazing experience in new york just amazing how many people came together for, for all these patients um never once did i see any ulterior motive not once in this day and age of technology we're globally connected can you offer please the timeline it took for your for our hospitals to discover that the ventilators were creating more problems and why wasn't there any communication with other countries who advance of us and how they were dealing with the issues with ventilators uh it's a good question um i'm not really okay so the timeline would have been april is when the united states started the united states started seeing the surge in New York, and that's where we had this protocol. We were going to intubate these patients very early. Um, it was early intubation before the patient crashes. That was that's what we would kind of tell each other. And then May kind of did, kind of did the same thing, but started to back off a little bit more because we were noticing that you know we weren't dropping dead from the disease. You know, um, so we were less you know fearful of doing things like BiPAP and you know all those things aerosolize everything so then we started moving towards that now why did we not notice that from other countries i know in italy they had a, such a lack of ventilators that they were using those like spaceship type those big bubbles i don't know if you've seen them they were in these bubbles and they they those are actually working we wanted those we wanted that but we didn't have that in the united states so um we've noticed that but we thought that so that technology was because they were, they didn't have enough ventilators. It was always a, they don't have enough ventilators. So this is why they're using this type of machine. We didn't realize until people, we were putting on the high flow nasal cannula and the BiPAP surviving. It took a couple months. So we probably didn't figure it out until maybe June where we said, okay, June, July, and definitely we're going to do everything we can not to intubate these patients. I don't know why there was no communication about that. I really, just people didn't know um, that that was an option. It was it was such fear, such fear that putting these patients on these non-invasive machines were just going to spread this disease throughout the hospital. You know, all the doctors get sick. You know, um, so I think it was because of that. It was it was a protective issue. Uh, I think probably we should um, move on and, and hear from. Uh, uh, Dr. Daniel Sweeney. Uh, Dr. Lowe has given us an incredible amount of information. We've answered some questions. I'm sure there are more people, but we'll have questions to, to Dr. Sweeney and also Dr. Lusbader, and I guess those questions will overlap. So uh, thank you so much, Dr. Lowe. You've been wonderfully informative, and, uh, and I now uh, uh, move on and hear what uh, Dr. Sweeney can tell us uh, and add to the picture you've started to paint. Uh, so let me introduce you all to Dr. Sweeney. Uh, Dr. Daniel Sweeney is a uh trained in critical care medicine. He's an associate clinical professor of medicine at UCSD, and he currently serves as a director of the ICU at the UCSD Hospital in Hillcrest, and he also research on various aspects of COVID-19 testing and treatment and the use of ventilators uh, in, in treating COVID-19 and in other types of patients. So uh, if there's anybody who knows something about ventilators and issues surrounding them, it, it's Dr. Sweeney. So uh, without any further uh, introduction, Dr. Sweeney, uh, you, the floor is yours. Okay, well, first of all, thank you for having me. I've never done this kind find myself in the academic setting giving medical talks. So this is a bit different for me, but I welcome the challenge and so far it's been very interesting. I thought what I could do, start with, if I could share my screen and, and show some slides that I gave to our university. So, this is a picture I need to submit to a medical journal. Um, and it's just a very interesting picture in medicine. What you're looking at is the view from one of our ICU windows of a patient with COVID disease and a worker looking out 
the window, maybe thinking they're taking a break, only to realize that even when they try to take a break from COVID, they're staring at COVID. What you see, in the distance, and a number of our early cases were from patients from cruise ships. So I wanna give you some facts, and some of these facts are, are center specific. These are from C. These are current as of a couple weeks ago. And what I wanna show you are essentially all of our COVID admissions, far fewer than what you saw in New York, but still you know, a sizable sample. So if you, from the ICU perspective, we've admitted between our two ICUs, one in La Jolla, one in Hillcrest, we've admitted 176 patients. And I want you to note that the ICU survival rate is 73%. Now, none of this is, and certainly the older you are, these numbers are going to shift in an unfavorable way. But I just want you to know that the moment you enter an ICU with COVID disease, your chances of survival are still better than uh, and then you see here, we have the number of mechanically ventilated patients. So these are a subset of patients in the ICU. And yes, that survival rate falls. But again, I want you to, to understand that your chances of survival are still better than your chances of not surviving. The last number is something called ECMO, which is basically when you're so severe, you get put on an artificial lung machine where the blood, it's almost like cardiac bypass when somebody undergoes heart surgery. This is not something that is offered to people over the age of 65, okay? But there's your rate there, it's lower still. So this is an interesting article. Uh, and what it showed was really the importance of tertiary centers like big academic centers. And what it showed, uh, this is, Times, but it's quoting an article from JAMA, which is one of our big uh, medical journals in the field, showing that you were three times more likely to die if you were admitted to a smaller hospital. And I think this really speaks a, a little bit to what you've that when systems are stressed, um, outcomes are worse. Um, and again, we accepted 88 transfers. Uh, what, do you, what happens when you go well, what we found early on in the pandemic, everyone was in a rush to do something. You know, my father was a pipe fitter and he used to say, you know, do something even if it's wrong. And, and that approach really works. Plumbing, uh, it served him well in his career. It doesn't serve you well in medicine. And sometimes you're better off, as we say, standing and, and, and doing nothing or standing and providing supportive care, which, which is doing something. Ventilator management, we've, we've really gotten better at this since the pandemic began. Prone positioning, this is where we take a patient and we flip them on their belly. And we found that patients are better able to ventilate this position. Now, whether or not this provides a survival benefit remains to be determined. Um, and then we're just very judicious in terms of looking for secondary infections. It's tricky updating and families because they can't come into the ICU. Uh, this is an ECMO machine. Uh, and I should tell you, any of the, all these patients uh, agreed to be in these, these slides. Um, and this is, essentially has a large cannula in their neck and that blood is flowing out of their neck. It's flowing into a machine that oxygenates their blood and then back into a vessel in their leg. And again, all of this is being done in the setting of so very tricky. Okay, I think it's very important, and I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but there's really been two, two pandemics. There was the, the initial, I would say, and then there's a secondary one. It's really important what we're not doing, and much of what we're not doing is based on mistakes we made early on. For example, hydroxychloroquine was something that was promoted, and uh, with, with really, abandoned the scientific process in April, uh, in March. And, and, and I don't fault people for this. People wanted to try to do something, but sometimes doing something can actually be harmful. And we've abandoned the approach. Um, and, and this is something to our university's credit, we never did. 
This is an HIV medicine that people started giving people in China, other parts of the United States. We said data, and there was no benefit. This notion of, yes, we're seeing patients with abnormal coagulation lab values, but actually, you know, taking that next step in treating these patients is a whole nother whether that benefits them or not. And to the, you know, uh, being a total purist with the data, at this point, prophylactically, in other words, if somebody comes in with COVID disease and just starting them on, on, on coagulation has not been shown to be beneficial. So again, it's, it's I still say, and at, at the risk of sounding like Yogi Berra, it's just as important what we're not doing. Uh, and we're really cutting back on antibiotics once we realize they don't have a secondary infection. Uh, our university has done a really good job at vetting drug trials. Okay, this was an article that my colleagues uh, published saying addressing the what is just give the drug rationale, making sense for clinical trials and against off-label use. In other words, if you're going to test something that's experimental, test it in the setting of a formal trial. You're not doing the person or the benefit if you do otherwise. Okay, so these are just some of the other places we work. I'll skip through that. Um, uh, these are some of the trials I've been a part of. Um, this is the, the trial that really was the first trial to show a drug specifically beneficial for COVID disease. Um, and again, this is something that we only give patients once they're in the hospital. It's important to talk, you know, I realize the, the group I'm talking to, I think it's important to talk about the people who didn't make it just as much as it was important to talk about those that did make it. And again, I said, when you come to the I, three quarters of the patients that we saw uh, continue to survive. Uh, but some people didn't. This was one of my first patients that I saw. Um, there was a couple actually. And, uh, you know, the husband, he woke up in a nursing home. Uh, excuse me, he woke up in a um, uh, acute care facility he had to be told that his, you know, gut wrenching. He had to be told by his family that his wife of 50 years, this is them at their 50 or 60th wedding anniversary celebration, uh, that she didn't make it. Um, but, you know, um, that's him leaving the hospital. I've stayed in touch with him. Uh, he's living a meaningful life now, albeit without his wife. Uh, this was another patient. We mentioned tracheostomies. This is another patient. Now, yes, he was a young patient, uh, but he sent me this picture, you know, such as the age of bones, and he sent me this picture saying, Doc, look what's missing. And it's his tracheostomy. He's back to work. Um, I will digress. I love this quote. Sports do not build character. They re And I think the pandemic has done the same thing to our hospital systems. It's really shown us, you know, amongst our colleagues um, and, and amongst our system, so to speak, which ones have uh, has, has really been revealed. And I'm very proud of, of many of the people I've worked with. Okay. Um, so I'll leave you at that. I will uh, unshare my screen. Okay, just to, I, I promise you, Barry, five minutes. Okay. Sure. Okay. So I think a, a couple things, and again, I realize part of what we're doing by talking to you is telling you an interesting story. One of the reasons we're here is to sort of give you some advice if, God forbid, you find yourself in a tough situation where you have to make a decision about what kind of care you want to receive. I think that's one of the goals. Is that a fair statement, Barry? So I think to, to really a answer that question, I think you have to begin with, this is a nine month old disease. Most of the diseases we've been treating, we've known about since antiquity, okay? Uh, so yes, we're starting to see some patterns. Yes, when somebody has been intubated for two weeks, the chances of them coming off and living independently are dramatically Okay, uh, but again, uh, it's a nine-month-old disease. We're still learning about 
about what this disease is going to look like. Nobody knows what this disease looks like a year from now for a survivor. Somebody who could do the New York Times crossword puzzle and then gets intubated with COVID disease and goes to a skilled nursing facility and comes out, can they still do the New York Times crossword puzzle using a pen? Nobody knows that answer right now. We just don't. So when you're making these kind of decisions, you've got to realize that nobody has all of the answers for you. Um, so just, again, two pandemics. So I'm just going to rapidly go through some what if I was talking to a med student. From an epidemiologic standpoint, I really think we're dealing with two pandemics. The first one where hospital systems were stressed uh, and the mortality rate was much higher than what we're seeing now when systems are. Okay, the pathology of this, this is a virus, it's, it's part of the coronavirus virus family. There's about four of them that typically circulate. Usually they're seasonal. Uh, everyone on this Zoom has been exposed to coronaviruses. Uh, they tend to be much more mild, but this one is not. It's in the same family of, of MERS and SARS-CoV-1. It likely came from, from bats uh, originally. In terms of, you know, what's the clinical course? 80% of people who get this disease have a very mild course, okay? Um, what does it look like when you get infected? You are more infectious uh, in that period before you know, or you're, let me just say, you're very infectious in that period before you, you have symptoms than when you actually develop symptoms. So that's what's this disease tricky. It's sort of like the flu, except you can be a lot more infectious before uh, you actually show symptoms. Um, and as I said, 80% of people deal with As people get older, the big risk factors we're seeing are, are age and obesity. In terms, of, in terms of treatment, if you don't go to the hospital, uh, people are going to treat you with uh, your fever, they, they might treat you with bronchodilators to help you breathe a little more easily. If you do come to the hospital, you'll almost certainly be on a drug called remdesivir, which is an antiviral. Um, you may be on steroid. Uh, yes, it is a, you know, there's evidence for steroid treatment in a lot of big trials, although there are some of us in the field that are, are sort of temporizing that data, so to speak. If you do get into beta, because doctors did not, in most cases, did not think about treating you with alternative methods, okay, of oxygenation. Most of us, we, we I'm not trying to be uh, curt, uh, but we don't, we don't do procedures for no reason. So we, we generally hold off on intubation, and, and that's something that is, we, we've really sort of grad, uh, grown to accept as the pandemic has gone over. Uh, in the meantime, what can you do? Uh, and I'm sorry if this sounds political, wear a mask, okay? A mask, to me, I, I find it interesting that it's become political. Wearing a mask is about the thing you can do. It's, you're saying, I care about the person I come into contact with enough that I don't want to infect them. Wearing a mask, more than anything, protects other people. Uh, might it protect degree and depends on the kind of mask you're wearing, but first and foremost, a mask makes you unlikely to, to infect someone else. Socially distance as, as much as you can. Um, America has had seven million uh, cases. We've had 200,000 deaths. Uh, we're not doing a very good job of this for who we are in the world, and it's because we never really, we never really uh, shut down probably had to. And so in the meantime, wear a mask, socially distance. Uh, inform your... Yes, sir. Oh. Well, no, no, I was just going to... I thought you were done, and I was just going to say uh, thank you, Daniel, and we were going to leave a little questions. I'm done. I'm done. Thank you. Okay. Again, thank you. Wonderfully informative. And um, I just want... I know people want to ask you some questions. Thank you, Dr. Sweeney. It was very informative. I was wondering if uh, what about uh, the vaccines that people are, uh, the varieties of vaccines, and if it is 
um, it becomes available uh, should this the people around our age group um, uh, not. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think uh, nobody's going to give you a definitive answer on that subject, okay? I would start by saying my prediction and other, in, not my prediction, other people's opinions who I trust, normalcy will not return until next summer, okay? Now, historically, I think the fastest vaccine we've ever, we've ever created was the Ebola vaccine, which was two. So this is going to be incredibly fast if we're able to get a vaccine out by December, say. And then it's going to be the whole distribution. Um, I would trust the scientific process stated. If they say, if, if we go about this in a methodical way where we, where we, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three, like we should, and we get to the point where we say, okay, should we test this vaccine in the elderly? Offer it to the elderly now, absolutely. But um, let's let's see how that plays out. Thank you. And it's the same question I was going to ask because Dr. Lowe uh, indicated that she feels comfortable working with these patients. She's mm -hmm. properly uh, protected. What about us when we're inside? I've heard that it's okay. If you're outside, you're within the bubble of people you're with in a living situation or who you're with a lot, but you really shouldn't be around people who you don't know well, you don't know contact they've had with others. And then as far as being inside, you should even limit any kind of interaction more, even if you are wearing a mask, even if you are distancing. So, you're absolutely right in terms of this being a lot more infectious inside, indoors. And I think that's part of the reason why you didn't see outbreaks with, with protests. People were outdoors and they were wearing But again, very different infectious risk indoors versus outdoors. Um, I, I think you need to be careful. Um, and by that, I mean socially distance, wear masks, minimize your shopping. You know, it's quite interesting. I feel safer in my ICU than I feel when I go to the supermarket, okay? Uh, I, know, I have full PPE. I know who's sick. I know who isn't sick, I, so on and so forth. Um, I think that it's a lot trickier outside of the ICU, quite, quite frankly. So uh, be careful. I, the other thing I think is, it's important in the age group I'm looking at, and I know this because my mother is coming to visit me, is, is contact with kids. And my kids spread COVID at, well, they get infected at just about the same risk as adults. They don't show symptoms like adults. Little kids, ironically, have been shown not to spread to the same degree as older kids. Reasons there's a trial out of South Korea. We think the reason is the height of the kid. So if, if you have someone who is a little bit taller, has a little bit stronger speaking voice, they're probably more infectious. Uh, be careful. Uh, I don't see any. Oh, Nina has a question. Yeah, just one more question. Um, that uh, it's a good idea to get the um, vaccination for flu, and and does that does that um, help at all? Great question. It's tiny little bit. Great question. So flu kills thousand people roughly a year in this country, uh, every year. Although I'm I'm anticipating a lower um, kill from from flu this year because people are wearing masks and socially distancing speaking you know, roughly 20 to 50,000 people a year so get your flu shot for that reason it will not protect you against COVID disease um, short answer well um, I think probably where our time is getting short so we need to move on but before we do I want to ask uh, Dr. Sweeney a question that I think almost all of us in this room are thinking about and that is 
if we go on a ventilator, if we have to go on a ventilator, uh, Dr. Sweeney, you've done a lot of research on ventilators, I know, and you're very knowledgeable about this issue. If somebody, we have, most of our members are 70 to many members that are 80 and 90. Yep. If we have to go on a ventilator, what are our chances of coming out and returning to a normal life? And what are the, what is the likelihood that we are, we will end up in a nurse, even if we survive, we will end up in a nursing home and spend the rest of our days in a nursing home? Uh, I don't have those, it's a great question, I don't have those numbers in front of me, and even if I did, how well they would perfectly apply because as we've already described early versus late in the pandemic italy versus california new york versus california things are different definitely the the the, the deck is stacked against you if you get to the point if you're in the age group you've just described and you require mechanical ventilation okay there's there's no question about that uh i don't think you're falling any percent survival rate okay which I showed you earlier of people who were intubated. I'm sure that number is less based on age. What that number is, I, I don't have that in front of me. Uh, we do have a palliative care doc here coming on in just a bit. I would say, I think sometimes though it's reasonable, especially in the setting of it's a nine month old disease, to say to yourself, you know, maybe I'll try this ventilation, but I'm going to put limits on it. If I don't turn around, then I think we need to reassess and we need to think about palliative care, compassionate care, compassionate extubation. Just pick a certain time frame, I think. Um, beyond that, I, I can't give you a spot that was helpful. Yes, well, I think it was, and I appreciate you making an effort. And, and again, thank you so much for the wonderful information you convey. It was very, very informative. And um, I guess we'll, we'll hear now from Dana Lusbader, who's uh, uh, going to be our next speaker, and, and she can maybe talk a little bit about some alternatives for people in their 80s, uh, 75, 80, 85, 90, who uh, might have to do a ventilator based upon some of the negative consequences uh, that they might fear. Um, um, and so let me, uh, let me take a, a moment to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Lusbader. She's like has a Vita and a bio. If I read the whole thing, we'd be here a half hour. So let me just tell you a few things. Uh, Dr. Lusbader is the chief uh, of the Department of Palliative Care for Optum New York metropolitan area. Lusbader is triple board certified in palliative care, internal medicine, and critical care medicine. And most importantly for our issues here, during the COVID-19 pandemic, she returned to work as an intensive overwhelmed New York City hospitals. Uh, she's also an elected board member of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine. So we're really fortunate to have her join us. And so Dana, uh, please tell us what you think we should know about COVID-19 from a palliative care standpoint in particular. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for having me. And I certainly appreciate it with Dr. Sweeney and Dr. Lowe shared as well just to sort of set the stage for some of the uh, palliative care issues that we've talked about and also again just to highlight some of the things we saw in New York City. Um, so just as you know uh, back in March uh, the mayor asked anyone to please come back who could to the ICUs to help out and so grateful that docs like Dr. Lowe came to New York to help us. Um, we would not have survived without those amazing healthcare workers that us um, in New York City at that time. And as you can see, what was happening here in April, just the epicenter of the epicenter, uh, especially in Queens. Um, I want to just mention this uh, and why Queens in particular got hit so hard. A population in New York City of about 8 million, Queens having about 2 million, but half the people in Queens were not born here in the U.S. And live in very tight living quarters and and one of the things and it kind of relates to the questions that have come up uh, from from participants here today is the risk factors associated with getting um, and they are really diabetes obesity hypertension 
and old age. And one of the things that happened in New York and New Jersey was that over half of everyone who died um, was from a nursing home. Functional status, if you're bed bound or in a nursing home or frail, uh, means a very poor prognosis. You're very likely to die if you get severe COVID, meaning you get hospitalized, you need uh, and certainly if you have to go to an ICU. People who are older um, or have other diseases like, again, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, do very poorly once they go into an ICU and certainly on a life support or breathing machine, ventilator, all the same thing. Um, really, we had that perfect storm in uh, Queens in New York City where all of that happened and a lot of patients, not because they were African American or Hispanic, but the risk may be that they have very severe underlying other diseases. So their diabetes is poorly controlled. They are obese, they have vascular disease or high that's really poorly controlled. And so that might be why uh, we saw such poor outcomes with people of color. Um, one of the things we saw a lot of, and this was true for the palliative care consults that we did, and also people we saw in the is a really weird um, virus. Very different than any other virus we have seen. It, it certainly we know it affects the lungs, and you see these really abnormal chest x-ray here where it's just kind of ditzy, all call it ground glass, but you just see it's not nice and clear. It should be clear black just to indicate air, but in this set of lungs, severe COVID, you're seeing a lot of ground glass. We saw a lot of purple, uh, and this is when people come in with these little purple toes on their feet, and this is early COVID because COVID causes blood clotting and abnormalities in the blood vessels. We saw people, here's someone on a breathing machine over here also, as well. So a lot of other complications from COVID itself. Blood clots, pulmonary embolism, 16% of people in the hospital had some kind of blood clot. So really an unusual cause so much blood clotting. Normally we might see five or 6% of people with blood clots in the hospital, but not, not 16%. And in the ICU, 29% of our patients had blood clots of some sort, either stroke attack or, or blood clots in the lung. And again, you know, we had people who came to help us from all over. This is one of the hospitals in Queens I worked in. And one of the things that just blew my mind one Sunday morning was when the pharmacy, and here's a tub here of IV fentanyl and morphine and dilaudid. And because we were going through it so quickly for patients on ventilators to keep them comfortable, the pharmacist just took uh, buckets of this stuff the counter here for us to take what we needed for our patients because there just simply wasn't time to catalog all these opioids and to kind of do things in the way we're normally used to doing. We just would take whatever was there because we medication and use what we needed for our patients. We also put patients in really weird spots. So this is an auditorium in one of the hospitals I worked in in New York City where they converted this beautiful person auditorium to a COVID unit overnight. So all of the seats were ripped out and I've given many grand rounds in this auditorium and here's the podium right up here at the front and they converted this to a sink that healthcare workers could wash their hands in the sink in the front here and this was all COVID patients by the next morning it was a hundred COVID patients on uh, respiratory support waived uh, uh, the uh, legal, uh, pr gave legal protection to workers here so that those of us who were working on the front lines couldn't be sued for taking care of COVID patients doing the best that we could and do something egregious. So a podiatrist or a dermatologist or a newly graduated medical student who was helping us was protected because they were just coming to help us on the front lines really of a war of ethical issues. And New York State had developed in 2015 a ventilator allocation guideline that all of the hospitals gathered together well before COVID um, to really talk about allocate ventilators. And we came up with exclusion criteria, so meaning it just simply wouldn't work 
Um, and there are certain people that might be just too moribund uh, to benefit from a ventilator. So we came up with criteria that way. A score, so how sick somebody is, we would use a standardized uh, acute score to measure their severity of illness. And then time limited trials. So every or five days, we would look to see again, do they belong on a ventilator or not? So this is what was evaluated and decided upon in 2015. And this uh, protocol was brought forward again a few months ago, we needed to start to think about this issue. We never had to ration ventilators in New York State. We never had to do that. But what we did do was we rationed staff, and that wasn't ever really discussed. So locations where there was superior care, where you had critical care physicians and critical care nurses at the bedside, and then there were other units that might be staffed by someone who's not an intensivist, maybe staffed by a dermatologist or a, or a hospitalist. Um, and so we did have areas where we had inferior and superior care based on who was managing these very, very sick people on ventilators. And there hasn't been a lot that's about that because it's not a pleasant thing to talk about, but there were better units and worse units. And, and certain units you were much more likely to survive in if you landed in that unit compared to others. Same is true for certain hospitals. We ran out of dialysis fluid. So we had to shorten dialysis time uh, and we would have to make decisions based on who we could um, save by giving dialysis or doing it longer. Palliative care was really, we would talk with critical care folks all the time. We would work with um, other teams to make sure we weren't offering things to patients that wouldn't work or that were against what they would want and value. So very important here to know what gives meaning and purpose in people's lives so that we didn't offer things that made no sense and didn't really align with what people would want. People were alone. There were no visitors allowed, um, not even for delivery, no visitors, particularly in April. Um, and so what we would actually do is have these COVID iPads. And so we would go into the ICUs and have family meetings with patients. Um, and this is here on nurses, this is the COVID iPad in a Ziploc bag. And before we go into the room, because you got to put on goggles and more stuff, we really wanted to at least speak with the family first to make sure that they wanted to see their loved one. And we wanted to explain what we're about to see. We would then go into the room, and here you can see they're putting in a line or something in this patient here, but this patient's on a ventilator, and we could show the family that yes, we were doing absolutely everything for their loved one. Families would want to sing a song or play music or say something very special to, to their loved one. Sometimes if people were not on ventilators and they still were able to talk to family members, they could actually have a conversation back and forth. We were able to use FaceTime or Skype. A lot of restrictions were uh, removed. And so for telepalliative care or telemedicine, we were able to use whatever worked for families. Um, and that made it very easy to connect with families um, because we could use WhatsApp or anything that worked. And we would really bring in many family members. Sometimes we have somebody, their son is in California, their daughter's in New York, the other one's in Boston, somebody else might we bring everybody together virtually to be with family because nobody was allowed in the buildings. Um, I wanna talk about medical decision-making in general, but especially um, during COVID. Um, important that everybody, especially here on this call, but everybody has a person who could make medical decisions for them in case they cannot. A healthcare proxy is the most important thing to have. And we would ask everybody who still talk with us, who would make their decisions if they couldn't. We really tried to do this, especially before we put them on a breathing machine. But it really was important that everybody just named somebody and that we had the phone number so that if they stopped on their own, or we had to put more stuff on them and they weren't able to make decisions for them because they got too sick. There was somebody that knew what, what they wanted and valued in life. And it doesn't have to be that complicated. It can be, you know, I value recognizing my children or grandchildren. I don't want to be a burden to other people. I would never want to live in a nursing home. Or maybe I'm the kind of person where every moment matters. And I don't care how much pain there might be, but I'd rather die in an ICU. 
you know, whatever that is for the person, it's really critical that the healthcare proxy knows the patient's wishes and values, because then we can make medical decisions that align with that. Living wills, and maybe controversial, I'm not sure, but it, they're really useless. You know, when you go to a lawyer and you complete a five or 10 or 20 page legal document, there's no place for us to put those in the electronic medical record. And they often don't have the situation at hand, and they're really hard to understand. So what's most useful is to have just a healthcare proxy, somebody who knows your wishes, who's able to express what your wishes would be for that situation. And here on the call said, so you know, if we get intubated, go on a ventilator, you know, should we allow that or not? Well, it's a really good question because maybe you go on a ventilator for a time limited trial and COVID here is different than other diseases. Most other diseases, you could wait four or five, six days you kind of know where things are going to be at the end of a week in terms of outcome and recovery. With COVID, it's at least two to three weeks before we know how the patient is most of the time. So if somebody's on a ventilator and it's just their lungs and their kidneys are still working, we actually might want to give them that full three weeks because maybe they're going to turn around. Um, we had in one month, and I was working in 1,151 patients on ventilators. Uh, it's, it's a huge number, more than anywhere else in the world. So we had all these people on ventilators, and some really did well, but you have to wait three or four weeks how they might do. Others we knew very early they're going to die no matter what we did, and in palliative care we saw them right away. Their kidneys weren't working, their blood pressure dropped, they might be 90 years old from a nursing home, really they might just be suffering this isn't a quality of life they would want they wouldn't want to die this way and so very often we kept those patients comfortable and actually stopped the ventilator we just took it off because it wasn't in keeping with their wishes a living will that's very complicated and can't relate to this situation doesn't really help very much and honestly I never saw one I, I took care of hundreds and hundreds of COVID patients um, in the various hospitals I never saw uh, a living will once any family there to bring them um, and they weren't in the electronic health record so not even very practical but really important to have a healthcare proxy or just a person who knows what you value um, a little bit about uh, palliative care and, and how we really try to uh, elevate everyone else's skill levels too one of the reasons we do things to patients that makes no sense is that doctors practice how they were trained better at training physicians in basic palliative care skills and we're doing this now in medical school so that we're training doctors very early how to ask patients what they want and value so that if somebody's given a diagnosis of something like cancer or advanced COPD or advanced heart failure we can start to find out what matters most to them so that we don't do things to them they wouldn't want done and we can make sure that all the things we offer them make sense um, we also here try to do that too. So whenever we would do a family meeting, like in, in this patient's room, we would do a, a palliative care family meeting. We, we'd invite the nurses and the respiratory therapists and everyone to join, meet who's taking care of their loved one. But also we wanted to train everyone else how to have a good conversation with a family member. And that might go something like this, you know, tell me about your mom, you know, what, what are the kind of value um, you know, if we can't get her off the ventilator and she has to live in a nursing home, if that's the best case here, would that be something she would want? You know, to really be very clear on what we're talking about, on what the best case would be, so that we can actually start to make recommendations to families about what we think should be done based on what we know about the patient's wishes. So it's really important to have a healthcare proxy that knows your wishes, form filled out so that they actually, uh, if they do go to a hospital outside of California and you find yourself in New York or somewhere else, that could be produced um, somewhere so that people know. We took people's word for it too, if they just identified their son member, you know, we would certainly um, take their word for it. But it was really important that a conversation occurred hopefully before or that that person at least knew what their mom or dad or, or son or daughter would have wanted value in life. 
uh, what gives life meaning for them. And those kinds of things were, I think, very, very helpful for, for this pandemic, having family members that knew that. Because again, keep in mind, this is the scene inside the room and there's no family around at all. So the hospitals were pretty quiet because all that was in there uh, were COVID patients and, and healthcare workers, um, really desolate in terms of other family members, even for those that were dying. I'm gonna pause now and just take time for questions. One presentation again, thank you so much, Dr. Lesbader. Um, we do, I'm sure, have some questions for you. I know uh, uh, we have people who want to know uh, something about palliative care, for example, if if they decide to stay home. I, we have who uh, I know have committed to staying home no matter how bad that gets and only accept palliative care. And so that's a question somebody I'm sure will ask. And if they don't, let me ask it just to start off Q and A for you. Yep. So very important. So the, the the two ways we can deliver palliative care at home right now, uh, one is of course through the hospice benefits. So if somebody has an underlying disease already, like they have or heart failure or they're 90 and they get COVID. Now we can treat a lot of COVID patients at home, by the way, with oxygen, we can follow uh, the pulse oximeter, um, and like Dr. Lowe said, we, we really let people go very low, much lower than we would have ordinarily uh, in this disease, and we can actually help people sometimes get through it. But then there are those who are going to die when they get COVID because they're frail or very sick. And for those patients, we want to enroll them in their Medicare hospice benefit. And the reason that's so important is that that's the way we get doctors and nurses into people's homes 24 7 and we get the medications in that we would need to keep people like morphine and ativan and other things because it's very hard to breathe and you really need to have access to opioids like morphine or dilaudid or fentanyl or these kinds of drugs and these are the things that we use when we're treating who are dying at home but especially in a disease like this where we're going to want to have a uh, people who are going to be able to respond if somebody's not feeling well or not doing well. And that's the benefit that we would engage for that. Um, the papers that I'm seeing from people that are being treated at home, their survival rate is less than those who are being treated in the hospital for COVID. Can you comment on that, please? So survivability of COVID relates to underlying risk factors age age being number one certainly so the very old and nursing homes in particular if you're from a nursing home the is very high uh, so so age matters a lot and then underlying risk factors also if you get a complication from covid like a blood clot or or stroke or something the mortality goes up same as true cancer. um but if you're treated at home and you're you're otherwise healthy uh, there are ways we can keep people at home. Uh, we do a lot of uh, COVID telemedicine, for example, to protect people from having to go. So we can do telemedicine every day, for example, if people's wishes are to stay home um, and treat them at home with home oxygen, with BiPAP, with steroids, with other medications so that they can stay home. And if they turn around, but if they begin to die from COVID on top of their other chronic conditions, that's when we want to engage hospice because those that benefit would provide us with docs and nurses who come to the home. There are some hospice home palliative care programs, but there aren't that many nationwide because they're hard to pay for. Hospice has a payment mechanism through Medicare, but home palliative care programs, um, they're not available. So for the home care, is the patient evaluated by their comorbidities and their age on top of it, whatever, before that approval is done? Yes, yeah, so, so if you enroll patients into hospice, so let's say somebody is uh, 90 years old, uh, they're starting to get very short of breath, they have underlying disease like cancer or heart failure or something else, they know for don't ever wanna go to a hospital, um, and they have COVID now, we might try to be very aggressive at treating that with oxygen and steroids and other things, but we might also say, look, it's very likely they might die from COVID soon. 
to doctors to say someone might die in six months or less so we can certify that yes that's probably true to get that benefit in place and and that benefit is so critical for somebody who's very sick now we can get a hospital bed nurses coming to the house we might even get a few hours a day of a home health aid that's covered by medicare once we enroll in hospital we get a lot more benefit better and maybe dr Lowe and me too if they want to uh chime in i think as you know as a hemlock society we're basically from 70 to about 100 so let's take an 80 year old kind of a middle of our group um and i i work of the home care i guess my question is if you provide or if the person can get that home care with oxygen and pulse oximetry and hydration all that good care do we have any evidence increasing the survivability and leaving the hospital in better shape by going to the hospital if we decline or is it really reasonable to say that in our age group if we get those treatments at home and we start to decline that we should just accept that it's the whole issue of what is the survival value of going to the hospital right yeah. so the survival value of going so you only go to the hospital if you can't breathe or your oxygen level 90 percent 88 percent on oxygen so the two reasons to go to the hospital are you're getting short of breath and just uncomfortable um and can't be managed at home or the oxygen level is dropping otherwise we really told home because when you go to the hospital and inundate the emergency room and then you the overwhelmed hospital system you know you we're not going to it's not going to be so good there. You, if you're going to a hospital, it's because you need either a, a ventilator or machines that will help you breathe more. If you have no underlying conditions at all and you're 80, but you're otherwise more or less healthy, um, you know, it's reasonable to go to the hospital if you can't breathe. Or we use pulse oximeters when we're doing COVID at home. So we, we follow patients for COVID at home telemedicine every day or twice a day to make sure that their oxygen is okay, they're eating and drinking okay, and they're they're breathing comfortably. Otherwise healthy, and you're now you're not breathing so well and you need, let's say, extra oxygen that we can't do at home, it might be worth going to the hospital for a time-limited trial. And what that might mean is let's go there for days and see if this thing turns around, but maybe you say, look, let's do everything, but I don't wanna go on a ventilator. That might be reasonable, or, I want to go on a ventilator, but but you know after two weeks, let's just really think. Let's just take it all off, um, and that's where your healthcare proxy really comes in because things change so rapidly with this disease. If things aren't going well after five days, maybe that healthcare proxy says no. Kidneys are shot. Liver pressure is not doing good. Stop the ventilator. Well, I appreciate that, but I'm still trying to get back to the survival value. I mean, and I know this is an early disease and we may not have the statistics and evaluation, but are we really seeing the 80 year old that is getting short of breath? Uh, that I mean, I assume, I'm, yeah, has anybody really looked at trying to bifurcate the, the intervention of not giving those interventions continuing? versus going to the hospital. We have this assumption that hospitals are gonna save us, but I think we know enough about this disease and being a viral disease that the interventions are not nearly as good as for many of the diseases that we treat in hospitals. Right, and it relates though, Hunt, to the underlying conditions the person has. So if you are otherwise healthy and 80 years old and you just have a little bit of mild high cholesterol and mild high blood pressure, but not terrible, perfectly healthy and you walk three miles a day or a mile a day, whatever, you know, and you're not doing well at home, you might have a shot at doing well with some supplemental oxygen in the hospital, like Dr. Lowe was saying, high flow, not going on a ventilator, but doing everything but that. You might even survive the ventilator. If though you have obesity, high blood pressure, history of cancer, 92 years old, um, and a lot of other medical going to do well and you might choose not to go to a hospital because things probably aren't going to go so well and you might say hey do everything for me at home because i have obesity and stage copd i'm already on oxygen from my co you know i'm in bad shape already you know 
dying in a hospital with COVID is a terrible way to die. So if it doesn't look like you're gonna turn around, maybe staying at home is reasonable. But I, I do wanna stress, you can go to the hospital, time limited trial of this stuff, and at the end of a week say, whoa, this is not what I signed up for, and go home. And go home with hospice and be cared for well at hospice for end of life care. Any uh, comments, uh, Dr. Sweeney or Dr. Lowe, that you'd like to add to, to uh, the comments of Dr. Lutzbader or uh, either of you? If not, we have another question from Mary. Hello? Yes, uh, my question was uh, if the um, uh, living will isn't helpful, how about the POLST form. Yeah, the, the POLST form, Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment form that you all have in California. Ours are Medical Order for Life Sustaining Treatment in New York. Those are very, very good and very good. What that is good for when you have a serious illness um, or you really don't want to go to a hospital or you want a DNR, do not resuscitate order, for those two things, do not or don't go to the hospital and you check those two boxes, it protects you and you get to stay at home no matter what. They're not useful really when people are otherwise healthy and complete them because sometimes people's or sometimes there's too much stuff on there that's checked off. Like it might say no BiPAP, which is the kind of mask we know might help with COVID. It might say no artificial nutrition and hydration. Well, that might be necessary over COVID for a week or two and maybe could save your life without you even going to the ICU. But if you are very, very sick and you know you don't ever want to go to the hospital and do not resuscitate orders appropriate, checking those boxes on the post is really helpful. And then putting it somewhere where everyone can find it, on the refrigerator or on the head of the bed. If it's buried or in a lockbox, it's useless. Thank you. Donald, do you have a question? Thank you um, all for the nice talks. And my uh, question is probably best directed to Dr. Lowe. And it involves, it seemed like there was a lot of evolution of, of care that you went through in different sites. And, and, um, and I'm wondering how you learn. This would apply to all of you, but you seem to have a lot of evolutionary changes with the, what you're doing, at least you described it. And in particular, did you, was national uh, group or organization or site or platform or something where you could go to on a daily basis on a as needed basis and jump off from there to ask questions get some help maybe put together a study like that yes there was um actually t a ton of resources um i um subscribed to a uh, specific kind of like a where there's like an MRAP, we call it MRAP, and then we have like a, a critical care podcast that all, all the doctors around the nation know what I'm talking about. And um, we have updates of COVID like every week. They have all of this and say, okay, this is what we're doing now. Okay, this is hydroxychloroquine has shown this. Uh, this is the new evidence that's coming out. This is what we're doing. So that is constantly coming out. Um, in addition to that, I have um, kind of like, um, through uh, like WhatsApp for, with other physicians that um, will constantly be releasing papers that have come out um, and talking about new evidence at their hospital. What we also did was, I remember the state was one of the first hospitals, you know, with their nursing homes, they started seeing the numbers. Um, we went to their hospital database and looked at what their protocols were, and then we copied those for our hospital. So we all kind of shared all this information even some of these um, podcasts that had subscriptions to them, they were all free. So anybody could go on and be like, okay, here's the COVID update. So that we were all like on board with what all of the changing evidence. So, I mean, it's pretty amazing to have all those resources. And of course, just tons of colleagues around the world in New York, California, everywhere um, that I could always ask for help. What do you think of this? What do you think about these ventilator settings? What, you know, I always had that at my fingertips. So that I think also, you know, it's a really profound and important question because when we look at the UK, 
um, and their ability to conduct some very large clinical trials. There's a large trial called the Recovery of Evaluation of COVID Treatments and Outcomes, and they published uh, the important paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that steroids work for severe COVID, especially people in the ICU. And steroids are important because they're and they're available worldwide. But we've had far more COVID here and we couldn't publish that. And I think part of it, it was a paper, uh, an article in the New York Times called Doctor versus Doctor. And it, and it describes how we were pitted in New York. Some docs would wanna just treat people with things and, and not study things. And then we would just throw things at them, hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, and all this sort of stuff. Instead of saying, hey, we don't know if this will work as Dr. Sweeney was saying sometimes less is more and we should just do what we know because there's no other disease where we just throw things at patients and hope it works uh, but we did that here and I, I worry that we didn't do what the UK was so able to do. they have six different trials going on now to really study different drugs in a very organized way so that 15 percent of all people with COVID are enrolled in a trial in that country and yet here we just couldn't get organized to do it and so I think it highlights the gaps in our ability to share knowledge very quickly, um, especially with like convalescent plasma and other things. The UK is way ahead of us on some of those trials. As I recall, they have a palliative care site there, that has a, a website, and I don't know if we have anything like that in this country or not. Uh, well, um, I know our time is getting short here, and. Uh, the guests have been kind enough to to stay with us for and our our um, you know members as well and and uh, I know we could go on asking questions to these uh, wonderful folks uh, for a long time. Uh, and, uh, I think we should probably uh, uh, wrap up our program for today. Um, again, I want to thank our our doctors who came and spent time with us. My gosh, it's been wonderful hearing from you directly and. Uh, Again, we appreciate the work you've done uh, in this pandemic. Um, and I guess um, uh, that's, uh, there, are, there are other questions and, and, and I guess the only other thing we can say is we're on programs like this. So uh, we'll, we'll probably have something else that deals with some of these issues that you maybe didn't get a chance to ask about. Um, but um, again, thank you all for coming. Um, I, I, I should make a final announcement, I guess, here, uh, you know, in terms of future activities, we have a, uh, our Right to Die film series that's uh, every other month, and we have coming up next month, the Right to Die film, uh, the film is uh, the Farewell Party, and Faye tells me this is a, a wonderful Israeli movie telling a unique, compassionate, and surprisingly funny story of a group of folks in a Jerusalem who decide to help their terminally ill friend end his life. Sounds like a good film. Uh, you can get uh, instructions about how to access the film and then join us for a discussion uh, on October 15th. Uh, so please do that. And uh, again, thanks everybody for joining us.